Easily one of the most iconic and famous cold cases and serial killers of all time, Jack the Ripper set the standard for depraved murderers for the rest of time. His grotesque murders, his MO, and his tendency to haunt and send letters to the police fueled the media coverage surrounding the case and would go on to confuse and interest people for years, including into our modern era, a good 133 years after the murders were committed. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at the murders and the investigation that would eventually turn cold. London's East End Whitechapel district is known as an area of depravity and danger, and this was certainly no different in 1888. The area was overcrowded with immigrants seeking a better life in London, and the close quarters, poor living and working conditions, and overall poorer nature of the area inevitably led to a rise in crime. In October of that year, the London police had estimated that there were 62 brothels in the area, with around 1,200 women working as prostitutes. Having several different nationalities all shoved in such a tight area also eventually led to social tension and racial unrest, causing police to have to frequently intervene to stop large violent outbursts. During this time period, violence against women in the Whitechapel district was tragically not uncommon, which would eventually lead to issues discerning which murders were actually committed by Jack the Ripper. Of the 11 murders of various Whitechapel prostitutes from April 3, 1888 to February 13, 1891, Five of them, known conveniently as the Canical Five, were widely agreed to be caused by Jack the Ripper. Despite the known depravity of the area and the murders that had already occurred by the time Jack the Ripper first struck, no one was quite prepared for the monster that was about to be unleashed upon the Whitechapel district. On August 31st, 1888, Charles Cross was heading to work on Bucks Row and passed by a woman lying passed out on the street with her skirt above her head. Cross, as well as a nearby man named Robert Paul, couldn't determine if she was dead or unconscious, and instead decided they would fix her skirt, alert the closest police officer, and then continue on with their morning commutes to work. It was around 3.40 a.m. when the men came across the body, so when both men, despite how close they were to the body, moved her skirt down, they were both unable to see her evident mortal wounds. The men alerted a man named Constable Misen, but by the time he was able to make his way to the body, it had already been discovered by an officer named John Neal. The two sent a third officer to grab a doctor, who discovered the woman's lacerated neck, which had been cut with a long and deep slice. Further inspection showed that her vagina had been stabbed multiple times, and her abdomen had been cut in such a way that it caused her insides to protrude. The woman was obviously declared dead, and the doctor was able to determine that she had likely been killed about 30 minutes prior. The police were able to determine that the woman was a prostitute named Mary Ann Nichols, and when they initially linked her to two murders, that had happened prior to this, that would eventually change. A week later, on the 8th of September, another body was discovered in the early morning by an elderly man on Danbury Street. The body was later determined to be that of Annie Chapman, and also featured a deep laceration to the throat, as well as further mutilations which included her abdomen being completely sliced open, several sections of flesh removed, the removal of her entire small intestines, and the removal of her uterus and sections of her vagina and bladder. During the investigation into Annie's murder, a woman named Elizabeth Long stated that she had seen Annie with a dark-haired man in a brown deerstalker hat and dark overcoat at around 5.30 that morning, around half an hour before Annie's dead body was discovered. Following Mary Ann and Annie's murders, the public opinion began to be formed that the person responsible for these crimes was a Jewish man known as Leather Apron, and this story would eventually be picked up by the media, and this claim was published as fact. John Kaiser, a Polish and Jewish shoemaker known as Leather Apron, was arrested on September 10th, although he would later be released as he had a rock-hard alibi for both crimes. It is not uncommon for modern serial killers to write letters in order to taunt the police, although it is often easy for the police to determine whether these letters actually came from the killer or not. In the case of Jack the Ripper, the police had to sort through around 700 letters from the public pertaining to the case, with several hundred of those claiming to be the man himself. On the 27th of September, the Central News Agency received a letter that started with the words Dear Boss that was apparently from the killer, and it was in this letter that he gave himself the moniker Jack the Ripper, a name that would live on in infamy as soon as the agency published the letter. In this letter, the Ripper also threatened that he would clip the ears off his next victim. Initially written off as another hoax among hundreds, the letter wasn't taken seriously until September 30th when two more of the Ripper's victims were found. The body of Elizabeth Stride was found around 1 a.m. off Burner Street with a six-inch gash across her neck. 
However, the noticeable absence of any abdominal mutilations have led some to believe that this woman was either not a victim of the Rippers or that he was interrupted somehow before he could continue work on his sick perversions. A possible interruption would have been the arrival of a man named Israel Schwartz, who believed he saw a man assaulting his wife on Burner Street and wanting no involvement in some domestic dispute, decided to cross the street and continue on his way. When questioned by police later, Schwartz identified Elizabeth as the woman he saw being assaulted that night and would go on to be mocked for his cowardice in the media and by the public. Around 45 minutes after the discovery of Elizabeth, another body was found, this time of a woman named Catherine Eddowes. Catherine was found with her neck slashed, her abdomen ripped open, her intestines removed and placed over her right shoulder, her left kidney and most of her uterus removed, her nose severed and face disfigured brutally, and most importantly, her earlobe was cut off, hearkening back to the threat in the Dear Boss letter. The murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes would go on to become known as the double event. The next day, October 1st, 1888, the Central News Agency received a postcard with details of the crime and handwriting that matched that of the Dear Boss letter, which led the police to believe this postcard, which would be known as the Saucy Jackie postcard, was the real deal. The postcard was published in the hopes that someone would recognize the handwriting. However, that obviously led nowhere. 15 days later, on October 16th, George Lusk, the leader of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, received a letter that began with the words, From Hell. It is important to note that this letter did not match the handwriting and writing style of the previous postcard and letter. However, as you will soon discover, it was definitely still noteworthy. Alongside the letter came a small box, which George discovered contained half of a human kidney. Catherine Eddowes' left kidney had been taken by the killer, and the author of the letter claimed that he had eaten the other half of the kidney that was not included in the box. While it may be easy to attribute this letter to some other psychopath, as it does not match the handwriting of the original letter and postcard, a popular theory had begun to flourish that the supposed letters from Jack the Ripper that were true were actually the work of a journalist who had access to information about the crimes, specifically either Thomas Bulling or Fred Best. If that was the case, then the From Hell letter could easily have been from the actual murderer who was tired of other people stealing the spotlight for his crimes. The final victim attributed to Jack the Ripper was a woman named Mary Jane Kelly, who unfortunately had the honor of being the Ripper's most brutal and disturbing murder. Mary Jane's body was found just before 11 a.m. on November 9, 1888, in her room off of Dorset Street. The mutilations done to the poor woman by the Ripper were unlike anything seen before, escalating his murders to a whole other level and rendering the corpse of Mary Jane barely passable as human. Her face had been maimed past the point of recognition, her throat was so severely sliced that the gash went down to the spine, and her abdomen had basically been emptied of its organs. Her uterus, both of her kidneys, and a single one of her breasts had been removed and placed beneath her head, and an assortment of her entrails had been placed down near her foot and generally strewn about the bed. The Ripper also took cuttings from her abdomen and thighs and placed chunks of flesh on the bedside table, and finally cut out her heart and took it with him. A doctor that investigated the scene estimated it would have taken around two hours to inflict this level of damage. In a stark contrast to the murder of Elizabeth Stride, this gruesome act of unfettered violence went to show what the Ripper was willing to do without fear of interruption from passerbys on the street, which very well may have been why he chose to attack a woman in the privacy of her own home rather than on the road again. Scotland Yard would eventually take over the case, and Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline was placed in charge. Over the course of the investigation and discussion in the years since, over a hundred suspects have been named and looked into, but obviously none of them have proved fruitful. Aberline's main suspect was an immigrant and convicted serial killer named George Chapman, who conveniently left London for the States in 1891, not long after the Ripper murders stopped. However, his eventual murders would end up being poisonings, leading many to believe that he wasn't the Ripper, as it is not especially common for killers to so drastically change their MO. Another favorite suspect was a Jewish barber named Aaron Kaminsky, who apparently had an intense hatred for women, especially prostitutes, and homicidal tendencies. Kaminsky was also interred in a mental institution sometime around 1890, which would have been around the time the murders stopped. One important note in the aftermath of this case was the occurrence of what is widely considered to be the world's first criminal profiling, in which police surgeon Thomas Bond was asked for his opinion on the case, and he produced an 11-point essay detailing his thoughts about the killer's behaviors and possible identity. As previously stated, there were multitudes of suspects named as potential rippers, and with this case now well over 100 years old and no signs of any new evidence popping up, 
it is likely that we'll never know the true identity of Jack the Ripper. Let us know your thoughts and theories down in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss another one of our videos. And we'll see you in the next one.